Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. Guinevere tries a new kind of in vitro. Gwyn trails her slender fingers along the cistern's crystal rim. The viscous fluid within pulses with light, purples like the bruises the injections raise on the pale flesh of her belly. She recalls how each cannula pierces her skin. Mercurial burn, breath suspended, pain delivered with precision month after month. Still, against Dr. Mervyn's admonishments, she wants only one this time and knows beyond question the gravity of her choice. Each is brilliant, golden, and luminescent. How will she choose? Mervyn swivels on his stool, his back to her now. His fingers work the beads. Crystalline, they glide on their taut wires, click one against the other. The silken sleeves of Mervyn's robe quiver at his wrists. The synodic period is 29.5305882 days, he murmurs. And of course, we've got our 16 moons, eight phases for each. The beads click, Mervyn's hands tremble, cerulean veins beneath skin translucent as papyrus. Gwyn's heart pounds in its human cage. But if we account for the sidereal period, 27.3217, then surely we must. The wizened doctor seems lost in his calculations. His silence emboldens her. Gwyn plunges her hand into the vat, cold steel of its outer shell gleaming. Mervyn turns on his stool. He rises and spreads his arms wide as if to embrace her, as if to strike her down. Like divining rods, Gwyn's fingers close around the orb. Gelatinous zygote, a female like the others. Yet this one pulses and crackles with light until Gwyn's fingertips burn. She swallows the egg whole. Its salty taste is secret on her lips then turns her green eyes to the security pad on the portal. Gwyn blinks once, and the bolts slide free. Your Highness, Mervyn calls, but he is too slow, and she is gone. Gwyn grows round as another moon. When the infant is born, the women of Gwyn's court admire her delicate features. Green eyes, lashes pale as corn silk, full lips identical to their own. They name her Saradwen, for she is imbued with magic. The women bow their heads as Gwyn anoints her. In the coming days and nights, each woman takes her turn suckling the baby. And in anticipation of Mervyn's demise, for he is the last of his sex and impotent in all but his powers of simple mathematics, Gwyn scrapes a few cells from the inside of her baby's cheek. She slides the invisible treasure from blade to vial and places the vial among the others. Hello there. Welcome to No Extra Words, the flash fiction podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dirsch. I'm your producer and editor. It is good to be back. This episode is being released on January 20th. The last episode that we came out with, number 72, was released on December 20th. So that's by far the longest stretch we've gone in the history of the show without putting out an episode. Special episode 10 goes into a little bit of the why. I'm not going to revisit all that. I'm just going to say it's good to be back with episode 73, coming back to do what it is that we do. The commentary on this one's a little bit of a challenge, and it's because the three pieces that I'm sharing with you today are wildly divergent. They don't really go together in any way except in my head. And so try, I think you could pick up on that by the title of the episode, which is a line from the story that's coming your way next, which is so full of wonderful lines. I could have grabbed many, many titles out of that one. It's awesome. Because of the hiatus, 
we reconfigured the entire schedule as to what's coming to you when. And so basically I got to have the rare treat of looking at all the stories that were coming up and rematching them together and realizing that I was going to release an inauguration day episode, which was never something that I expected to do. And so I got to look at my list of all the things that were available to me and pick the ones that seemed to fit in an inauguration day moment that I really didn't want to talk about because this is not a political show. But I couldn't ignore, you know, you can't ignore what's happening around you. Political or not, we are all products of our environment. And that includes me and that includes this show. And so I don't want to go into the politics. But I think it's safe to say most of us are in some kind of coping mode, whether you're for or against the things that are happening around you. There's probably a good chunk of people with whom you're right now mad. That's just how we're functioning right now in America and really in the Western world. And so I think we're all looking for ways to cope. And I think the three things that I chose to bring to you today are examples of how I personally am coping. The first is be empowered. And that's how we started. Guinevere tries a new kind of in vitro to me feels like a very empowering story. It has this dystopian but yet feminist core to it that is really cool. It made me think about whether you're for them or against them, all the people out this weekend marching in their pink hats. The empowerment is huge for people who don't feel empowered. And so that's my first coping mechanism is to feel empowered. Remember your power. I was talking to a friend who asked me, are you marching this weekend? And I told her that's not really my style or my thing, but I find other ways to empower myself. And that's how I wanted to start. The second coping mechanism that I have is to embrace the ridiculousness and remember to laugh at things that are ridiculous. And there are a lot of things that are ridiculous that are going on right now. James Bezerra's story, Blood Feud, Melville versus Hawthorne, is the perfect story for embracing the ridiculous. It's like it was tailor-made for that moment. And like I said, the name of our episode today, The Superiority of Rigid Categorization, which is couldn't be a better title for this episode, for this world, for this anything, is lifted straight out of that story. So thank you so much, James Bezerra. Sometimes the universe sends you exactly what you need. The third thing I'm sharing is not short fiction. It's a little bit of a divergent from what we do, but it was inspired by a friend of mine, a librarian friend of mine, who her coping mechanism is to tweet important historical documents to the president-elect one line at a time. She's tweeted him the Bill of Rights. She's tweeted him the Constitution in its entirety. She's encouraged other people to pick like a favorite Supreme Court decision or something like that um, and tweet them at him. And I tried to think, you know, this seemed like a great moment because historical documents are both great literature and great politics, the great combination of the two. And it seemed like an awesome moment to share one with you. This is actually, I'm recording this episode on Martin Luther King Day, which I know by the time you're hearing it has passed. But that's the other thing that's kind of creating its own historical shadow on this week. And I actually really would love to play you um, some of a Martin Luther King speech, but I can't because of copyright and intellectual property issues. Plus, again, the holiday will have passed by the time you hear this. But today, while I was looking on Facebook of all places, one of my podcasting idols, a woman named Elsie Escobar, who describes herself as the podcaster happiness expert, she... uh, works for one of the great podcasting hosts and her entire job is to get on social media and talk about podcasting. It's like the most wonderful job ever. But she put up a Martin Luther King Jr. quote that she said seemed perfect for podcasters. And I completely agree. It is, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. I think that's just so profound that, you know, on this holiday, this MLK Day, that is really an invitation to reflect The idea that your words have power only if you use them. One of the things, again, I'm talking about my coping strategies here on this episode. And one of the things that really helps me is an eye on history and an understanding that we have been through very dark times as a country and as a society and as a culture. And we have somehow gotten through them. And there have been people who have tried to take down this society there have been people in our distant past and also in our recent past and we have not let them and we have in tough moments we have found great leaders and we have found we have not always been perfect um we didn't start out perfect and we're not there yet but 
we have somehow managed to continue to get better and not worse. And so the piece, the historical document that I'm closing the show with today comes from a very, very dark time and speaks with very, very great optimism. Um, again, beautiful literature, beautiful words by a very talented speaker. And also, I think, a moment that really causes us to reflect historically on what an inauguration is, what a transfer of power is, what a conflict is, and what a society and a culture and a community are. So I'm going to close with that in hopes that it might help you with whatever it is you're coping with today. So be empowered. Keep your eye on that history. Know that we do make it through. And also coming up next in James Bezerra's excellent story, please don't forget to embrace the ridiculous. And I'm just so happy to be back, guys. Whatever happens on this inauguration day, I'm happy I got to get on the microphone and talk to you. Coming up on No Extra Words, awesome stuff. Episode 74 is going to be one of our rare gem four-story episodes. Love doing those. They're so fun. And I am currently at work on a special that I am going to release as soon as we hit a thousand Twitter followers. And we are very, very close. Twitter and me, we have a love-hate relationship. Um... I still am not quite sure a year and a half into being on Twitter that I really even understand Twitter, but I think it's a fabulous place for writers to talk about writing, to find other writers. And that's what I try to do with our Twitter is curate that kind of writing content. And I think we have great conversations there. So we are edging ever close to a thousand followers. And as a special reward for y'all, when we get to that thousand followers, I've got special episode 11 ready to drop because I know we haven't had a lot of episodes of late. So I want to get more content out to you. So if you are listening to this and not currently following us on Twitter, it's super easy. It's at no extra words. And you get the voice of me. I'm Chris Baker Dersh. So that's just some of, I've got special segments coming. It's just some of all the exciting stuff that's ahead on No Extra Words. So stick with us, you guys. And in the meantime, here's James Bezerra embracing the ridiculous. Blood Feud, Melville versus Hawthorne by James Bezerra. There was a significant, though never previously reported upon meeting, long about 1852, which brought together the greatest American minds, living, dead, and otherwise. Tesla was there too, but dressed in drag, as he was not at the time a citizen, and because Edison had said he would not attend if Tesla was invited. Whitman was there, sitting on Emerson's lap. The ghost of John Winthrop was there, annoying everyone by sliding a penny up a wall, which he had only recently learned how to do. The as-yet-unborn consciousnesses of T.S. Eliot and Thomas Pynchon were projected into dilithium crystals. Andrew Carnegie had called the meeting. He was, at the time, beginning the project of assuaging his soul by building libraries across the country, and when he called the meeting to order, he set down on the table in the center of the hall two books. One was The Scarlet Letter, and the other was Moby Dick. And he asked the Honorable Assemblage of Americans, What are we supposed to do about this? He was an officious man, and needed his adopted country to choose a literary tradition. Though the transcripts of the meeting have been lost to history, the minutes were kept in an unnumbered safe deposit box in the vault below the tower, which J.P. Morgan built and filled with gold doubloons, and which he frequently amused himself by swimming through while wearing a top hat and waistcoat. The minutes are clear about the group's decision, but one need not read them to know what was decided. It was Nathaniel Hawthorne who carried the day, and this decision has been rippling down through the American literary tradition since. It was a decision in favor of the straight line, a decision that texts are allowed to be no more than 20% weird, and a decision in favor of retaining guilt and shame as primary characteristics of the American consciousness, though ones which need not ever be addressed directly. In his essay, Ostracons at Amphipolis, Michael Martone tells us that the original title of North by Northwest was The Man in Lincoln's Nose, and what a wonderful world it would be if that title had remained. How ashamed we would all have to be if one of our most sacrosanct films came fitted with the albatross of such a stupid name. How required we would have been to acknowledge the sublime and the strange present in the incongruity of all things. Lo, how that might have challenged our sense of the superiority of rigid categorization. One of the chief claims made against Moby Dick was that its alternating chapters presented too much information that was essentially true, albeit about whales. It was wondered if the country's population would have to begin to be able to distinguish on their own between that which was fiction and that which was not. 
it was worried that asking the reader to develop the muscle to discern the difference would create an unruly population no longer willing to simply believe that what was written in their newspapers and hymnals was true because it claimed to be. Ultimately, it was a decision made in favor of protectionism, a tariff placed on the imagination. In the essay, Genre Queer Notes Against Generic Binaries, Kazim Ali writes, quote, What is painting? Oh no, who first exhibited paintings along with their instructions and then dispensed with the paintings and exhibited only the instructions, unquote. As a concession to Melville, it was agreed that Moby Dick was henceforth to be regarded as a great American novel, G-A-N, though with the provision that no one would actually ever read it. In the essay, Study Questions for the Essay at Hand, Robin Henley warns us, quote, This essay practices hot yoga, but it's tired, and it's bent out of shape, and is blending with other essays and other forms of discourse within its personal space, unquote. Once the meeting was adjourned, Melville was summarily executed and replaced by an imposter who was a very handsome lunatic. The body was buried at sea. Lincoln's Second Inaugural Address, delivered Saturday, March 4th, 1865. Fellow Countrymen, at this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first. Then a statement somewhat in detail of a course to be pursued seemed fitting and proper. Now, at the expiration of four years, during which public declarations have been constantly called forth on every point and phase of the great contest which still absorbs the intention and engrosses the energies of the nation, little that is new could be presented. The progress of our arms, upon which all else chiefly depends, is as well known to the public as to myself, and it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insurgent agents were in the city, seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish, and the war came. One-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest, all knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union, even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph, and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible, and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not that we be not judged." The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, 
and that he gives to both north and south this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offence came shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living god always ascribe to him fondly do we hope fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away yet if god wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's two hundred and fifty years of unrequited toil shall be sunk until and until every drop of blood drawn within the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword as was said three thousand years ago so still it must be said the judgments of the lord are true and righteous altogether with malice toward none with charity for all with firmness in the right as god gives us to see the right let us strive on to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations thanks for listening to the no extra words podcast for more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.